first and foremost thanks to Indranil for providing the basic overview of what we are getting into. Second, thank you all that you have at least some of you have taken note of this and you know tried to attend. Uh, that is something even if it is a very small number. So I was essentially saying that it is so nice that at least some of you have made good efforts to come over and uh, at least as I was saying this gives some encouragement and uh, I am sure uh, and uh, what Indranil said to you all you saw 41 already 2041 many of you would have been thinking where what would I be doing would I be getting into this field and where would I be maybe in the middle level in some organization maybe in the senior levels in some Many of us would be thinking, would I be living to see this happen as well? And that itself tells us the extent of the complexity is so severe. And it is so severe that seven nations who have had some basic and mature understanding of these kind of devices had to pull in their resources of mental frame as well as in terms of their technical capabilities around to try and harness in a device which could give you in the long run a solution for what he provided, uh, what he stated that is essentially a power production for the generation. Involvement in this device today is more than half the mankind around the globe because of these seven nations and you see the apportioning of the numbers. So that means that it is not that these are things which could have been just run of the mill, done every day, could be generated just uh, as one wishes. So there is a complexity factor involved. Now what do the physicists and engineers do to address this kind of complexity? And in our domain, I presume that, uh, let me just understand, are you from college or school? College. College and in which level? Physics. Third year. Excellent. Both of you also? We are from physics. Okay. And he is from high school, sir. Okay. Okay. So I have to do it in a manner that I bridge from here right up to the level there where there are professors and uh, educators uh, sitting. So uh, I'll try to just convey, it is essentially to give you, you a flavor to see whether these could be careers to aspire for, have an understanding of what to go in for. Okay. So having, having stated this, you have now captured that scientists, <coughs> primarily physicists have dreamt of some device they have come to a configuration and then it is the next level of scientists and engineers, technologists who are now trying to reach these objectives. And uh, in doing all of these with an objective and a global, is there a pointer around to global objective of meeting this target of having this machine constructed in a manner that the operational reliability is ensured. So when one talks of operational reliability, it is this wonderful colored object, the plasma, which is the other state of the matter after the solid state and the liquid and the gas is created appropriately to be harnessed in, in the right perspective, to be producing the temperatures which he was showing on those graphs, to be then producing the neutrons, to be then enabling possibility of the energy production and also the neutron enabled tritium production. I did not write my name on the slide because if you would have seen the first slide, it is essentially a team of engineers and physicists working in ITER India with a part of IPR also contributing in some important form 
with the global community of us and this is essentially even if I write my name it is not going to really reflect that I am presenting I am just presenting to capture some of the aspects that I understand. My name is Arun Chakravarti and I am there in Eater India as a scientist for a reasonable period of years. Some of you have not even reached that age, not some of you, you have not reached that, that age. It's 27 plus 28 years that I am into the Institute for Plasma Research working. So not on fusion, not on ITER. ITER as he said 2005 is the time when we joined and 2006 we joined. 2005 December actually and then the organization formation and all that took place. We are as ITER India since 2006 in some form and it has progressed. So about 13 to 14 years of uh, this organization. Okay. Now uh, some of the things that we I'm going to talk to you about is primarily going to have an emphasis on what we are doing here in India and uh, when we say we are doing here in India uh, we are talking of things we are approaching to do to deliver in a manner that there could be systems where we have been given some form of a design which has been carried out on a global frame maybe we could be a party to it as well and when it is made and delivered then in some form ITER as an organization takes the responsibility of the operability of the system. So that means that you have given something which is within some specification parameters and then you are having kind of handing it over you are a part of the operation team but you are handing it over as a global responsibility for the system to operate. So they are called in the ITER parlance as built to print makes no sense at this point of time of discussion but important is there are certain things which we design but design in a different perspective and there are certain points certain elements and certain systems which we design as a design to deliver a functional mandate. And there lies an important uh, aspect that once it is integrated into a system in ITER, we are responsible to ensure whatever that functional mandate has been for the system is actually met by the system. So if I am giving you, a, giving, if I am delivering to ITER a set of cryogenic lines, which are supposed to, in terms of quantification, uh, cryogenic lines, uh, the metricization are in different parameters. The most important metric that comes is what is the wattage loss in the transmission, in the transfer of the fluid. Helium is a very expensive fluid. So you will lose helium when you, if you keep helium outside, it is just vapor at a temperature which is between the helium temperature to the room temperature. It just immediately flashes off. So when you have to deliver it, if you have to say restrict the loss within 2 kilowatts of the transfer and if it is going to 3 kilowatts you are liable to ensure that it is rectified to bring it to that parameter is your responsibility. So back end your engineering at home has to be so sound, so solid that you are actually delivering 1.7 to 1.8 rather than the 2 that you have aspired for or been specified. So you aspire for something which is more stringent. So this is another class. It goes for these kind of systems, it goes for cooling systems, it goes for power supply systems, it goes for some of the heating systems like he was mentioning the radio frequency and such. So based on this kind of a classification, we, we essentially have uh, to do a design in a manner where we bring in many of our technology partners in the form of industry supporting us, in the form of uh, the, some of the institutes collaborating. But ultimate objective is to see that the approach is meeting the manufacturing and the deliverability. Now for us in this hall as I see, 
Manufacturing here means a very, very massive scale. What you are seeing in some of those configurations and the, and the photographs of what Indranil was presenting, these are enormous scales. These manufacturing therefore means of a very, very large size of industry or industries who have been trained to come up to that level of, you know, understanding and maturity. And they also built for the first time, of course, most of them. They also have to do it in what is called the management of the manufacturing, that is in terms of a scheduling of it. And uh, we always say that these are manufactured to the stringent quality requirements, which adhere to the French safety rules and regulation to survive the lifetime of eater. When we make these statements, we essentially mean that anything that you do has to meet the requirements which are imposed by some framework of regulatory body who essentially monitors what is safe for the system and thereby decides on what should be the quality protocols and the requirement metric that should be accepted for this system. In India also we do it in that way. We have the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. Our safety standards are of some kind. But when we go and translate it for the French uh, regulatory, which is called ASN, which essentially is a regulatory body for the French nuclear reactors, their, their, their mode of uh, engagement is somewhat different. The, the factors of stringency and compliances may still be the same, but the level of intervention is much more inclusive and all pervasive. By that I mean that when you do such a thing, supposing in a very simple frame we say that we have to make a vessel out of stainless steel. The traceability of the, okay, and you have made this with some, some welding, some machining, some, some qualification parameters of vacuum you have met, but the protocols of your acceptance of this kind of a vessel which goes into a nuclear system will have its traceability right from the person who has melted the steel for that production. Records of that, records of the welder very specifically, his qualifications that, you, not, the, not the degrees, but when you do a particular weld, the weld is then you know, sectioned, studied, and that particular metric, whether or not that has conformed, to the product in itself with all the radiographic or the ultrasonic examination of the wells, to the product's dimensional, everything is tracked through a single set of documentation chain which is very, very detailed in a manner that every bit of the history that has gone into the production of any component is embedded in the documentation system. This is a very different kind of documentation system that we, I have personally learned in what is seen in ITER. It's, it's unimaginable level of you know, clarity that is brought out. It's a lot of work. So if I have to ma make something, if some of us who have done experiments in the lab are doing it now, if for example a simple vacuum system costs you, a vessel costs you about 5 lakhs, to make this compliant with respect to this kind of documentation, it will take the cost to 8 to 10 lakhs. It's because of the efforts. It doubles up. So that is the way it is seen, and that is the way we have to, therefore, conform to. In primary requirements for these kind of devices, we talk of vacuum quality. We have to see the maintainability, which is the remote handling. We have to see that these are conforming with respect to the European uh, pressure, nuclear pressure vessel requirements, pressure equipment directives. We have to see that there are seismic, seismic means in terms of the, you know, earthquake, but in terms of that site, in terms of taking into account, I will just dwell on it a little bit more, in terms of the safety as far as the confinement boundaries are concerned, and all of this decide 
the choice of design fabrication code. What is the choice of design? It is essentially, apart from your analytical engineering that you do, you have to make sure that your design conforms to the code stipulations. And therefore, the selection of the code that I take for the design is determined and dictated by these kind of things. The materials that I choose will have to conform to all of these requirements. And some of them may be extraordinarily contradicting each other. So we have to really find out which is the best fit in amongst all of these. We, when we do all of these, we also have to ensure that am I rightly positioned as far as my maintainability is concerned, my repairability is concerned. So I should not be going into for a system which doesn't enable these kind of things. So in, in these kind of things, what we it is just don't uh, uh, you know focus too much on it essentially whether or not it is inside the machine of that beautiful colored uh, purple colored uh, you know plasma that is called a first confinement boundary the stringency class becomes very very high or it is in that external say for example a cryoline which is essentially taking the helium warm helium back into the system recovery so their vacuum classification and this vacuum classification will be very, very different. And what is vacuum that we talk about? Vacuum that we talk about, if you say that here, if you are having an ambient uh, number density in the atmospheric uh, normal condition, it is uh, 10 to the power 16 particles per cc, right? Then 10 to the power 16, 19. 10 to the power of 19 particles per cc. And then when you talk in terms of ultra high vacuum, you go to 10 to the power of typically 11, 12 particles per cc. And then comes lots of other complexities which you have to embed to ensure that kind of a consistency and compliance. So this is what we have as a background. So we have, as we already introduced to you, an outer jacket of the whole machine. It, it is very, it is a stated in a very simplified form. If you see the size of it, you will realize it. Shielding in the form of in-wall shields inside the vacuum vessel. Cooling water systems, cryogenic systems, radio frequency heating, ion si uh, and some neutral beams, power supply systems, diagnostics. These are systems which we are delivering to ITER in a manner that they occupy the whole logistics of ITER in, uh, in, in, uh, in the system in different zones, but contribute uh, extensively you know, to making of it or to the operability of it. And when we talk of cryostat, shields, cryogenics, cooling water, radio frequency heating, diagnostics, also the high voltage power supplies. We talk of something which is a domain where each of them almost involves materials, engineering either in the heavy or the precision kind. And so there is a material engineering, there is a material jointing engineering, there is a lot of electrical engineering, cryogenic engineering, hydraulic and all of this to meet them, the approach that we and not only us, anybody takes is make first a prototype of a certain scale. When you make that scale, have a justification it, through the form of engineering basis that whether or not the scale when I amplify it to the larger production meets my objectives of scalable parameters. So do prototypes, meet the requirements on the prototype, establish every such, then go for the bulk production, and then come to this realization. So again, time delivery with the desired quality is, uh, is, is the goal. Let me preempt a statement which I wanted to make later, is that projects of these kinds, which essentially means delivering to an objective delivering to a platform where you have your uh, global partners there, meeting the requirements in terms of, you know, one should not be waiting and therefore getting delayed for the other, which means lots of cost for some obvious reasons. It means that science here, the practice of science and technology here, embeds in 
an intense amount of what is called in large projects called project management and this is no less no less than any industry any top ranking you know uh, top level industry they practice in their shops in fact whatever is needed for eater i whatever i have seen we had to actually embed in into even the best possible companies within india also on the globe the practices of project management to really bring this kind of thing and this is something which is which is what maybe for people who are more into the field and more into the senior faculties should be having that appreciation that doing things for science for projects of this kind is not just you know on 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 something which is in the control of what we have it 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 invades through a large and entities large domains and large participation so scheduling monitoring loading with the resources following up on these following up and then taking a feedback and taking a corrective action corrective action taking your risk perceptions folding in into your risk on the scheduling and then coming back and looking at every periodic interval how do they go monitoring of the project fall back actions that you have enormous amount of work enormous and these are all things which are there embedded in people's mind who do these kind of things unless you do that you will never ever succeed in realizing this kind of a project this is no table top experiment but true that a table top experiment also in our system we learn now that as i see the as we see the european japanese and uh, some of the american ex ex experiences that even for a table top experiment they also have a planning element which is embedded in their system and that's a learning that we see for us in fact eater has taught us a world of documentation world of project management exercises and also into the frontiers of technology but then technology is something which we have also gone into and you know dwell in so we had to initiate something which is now a little bit uh, some of the r&d programs may be a little bit of a very uh, different kind of level but i will try to bring it at home to my uh, participants in the first bench and uh, and also a part of it in the second but for others it is clear a question that you raised on the academia and uh, in uh, and and their interaction um, i'll dwell on it a little bit then quality development is what we focus on and different test beds that we develop in iter india for the test facilities in doing all of this in the first case in 2006 actually we realized that there is a need to have or uh, it is an opportunity it is an opportunity as well for india so the iter opportunity enables us to engage the expertise that is available in the iits nits universities different colleges from the faculties who are interested in dwelling into it so what we had is what is called at that point of time a board of uh, a board for the research in fusion science and technology brfst under that we invited lots of projects we have given and i think to date about uh, 53 crores worth projects over the 10 years have been given i think 170 projects have been given and these projects have come out with wonderful science science is something which is embedded in these centers because they well go into the details of matter we have to practice something which is our mandate so we had this opportunity and now presently over the last 2 uh, years this has been taken over by the board of research of in nuclear sciences under the mega sciences project so there we have these provisions of granting uh, what is called uh, projects which are of importance so apart from all of this this has been the road map and the road map leads to the making of these kind of thing now let me make it simple this is a stainless steel shell which is 30 meters means 100 feet so if this is 50 this is double of that this would be around uh, yeah this would be around 2.5 times of this length height also similar steel vessel you cannot build to a very high precision 
because when you make steel of this kind these are steels of it is 200 millimeters of thickness you have to weld through in some areas it is 50 millimeters of thickness the tonnage is itself intimidating 3800 tons a truck normal truck five seven eight tons to carry this you can now imagine what is the kind of things that needed this kind of an entity cannot be built in a place and shipped to the site because of the sheer size no transportation route in the globe can take this what you need to do is you need to break into different segments and then you need to make something send it get it assembled there and then bring it into a final shape the breaking of this at the first logical level is you remember what she was showing uh, like inside this machine is built up now if this shell is already placed there you cannot build the machine inside so what do you do you put the base section first you build a lower cylinder then you uh, base section and the lower cylinder then you go to the upper cylinder then you go to what is called the top lid cover it up so when you have put the base section you have started the machine assembly after placing this base section so 2020 he was saying that this base section which is now fabricated available in eater is to be then made in the form of uh, a complete uh, assembly i think i'll come back to this after uh, the run up of the other some of the other things shielding blocks we said because of the continuity this has been done this way shielding blocks are essentially blocks which are placed between the walls of the vacuum vessel remember this kind of a shape that he was showing and this is a torus torus it goes like this no so between this base wall and the top wall you place these shielding blocks and about 90000 of them Borated steel plates, uh, total is I think around 80, 80 to 90,000 of them. These blocks are to be made to a precision assembly so that they don't create interface issues when they are mounted. And they are again several tons of them, same kind of tonnage that you saw earlier. So these are the basic purpose is to block the neutrons that essentially would otherwise stream out from the inside of this. losing it from the inside of this machine of this device and so to trap them you have some borated steels you also have some of these ripple corrections I mean ripple is like inside the magnetic field the uniformity of the magnetic field the quality of the magnetic field essentially goes by what is the uniformity all around so the ripples have to be controlled so there are some ferritic steels which controls the ripples so this is a kind of a huge bulk production that has to be done, done by some of the Indian companies. You must have heard the name of Larsen Tubro. Larsen Tubro is doing the cryostat. Larsen Tubro is also involved here. And there is a company called Avasarala Technologies Limited in Bangalore who is also doing. They, were the, they have the major share. Larsen Tubro is doing a part of it here, incidentally. So we have the cooling to basically remove water and till the time that we started doing this kind of a cooling water distribution for eater we never had a realization that we had a realization that cooling water system design is complex but in terms of the compatibility with respect to the code standards and the complexity of the devices uh, a cooling tower is made by Paharpur from Kolkata only but for 500 megawatts dissipation heat dissipation and it stands as one of the it is much much bigger than this particular enclosure in itself uh, or for example chillers are made of certain certain dimensions which has never been made by the Indian industry so these are things which have gone so uh, just ignore this part cryoplant is another area where we have uh, the world's biggest cryogenic refrigerator going to be in operation 75 kilowatts for helium and uh, there a very important contribution from India is these plants are essentially we don't have the capacity to manufacture these plants so air liquid France is doing it Linde cryotechnic is doing a part of the uh, system these plants produce liquid helium liquid helium is then 
taken from these plants through the cryogenic lines and that is the heart of the system. That the cryogenic lines has to minimize the liquid helium loss. Then they go into the loads and before they go into the loads they go through a distribution system and the distribution system and the cryogenic lines are essentially Indian responsibility. And I must really say here that there is, this is indeed an immense amount of recognition of the understanding and competence of the Indian community who engages in cryogenics and IPR happens to be one of the uh, pioneers in that top ranking because of the SSD device that we were taken uh, to we were considered to give, be given this responsibility having given this responsibility we had to make the cryo lines to conform to certain configurational aspects and this has been done very effectively and I think uh, this also I will discuss a uh, little more detail uh, these are four kilometers of cryogenic lines at 4.2 Kelvin seven kilometer of warm lines warm lines means okay still they are controlled in terms of the ambience and car cryo distribution boxes so in nutshell India is providing the full distribution of the cryogenics from the refrigerator which generates it for cryogenics you have a refrigerator and these refrigerators are complex refrigerators at the basic element you all must have read the thermodynamics it is essentially the joule thompson exp expansion which determines it that's the basic point but then to make that joule thompson expansion device to work for a refrigeration of this kind of a capacity is a massive engineering so that is in the refrigerator and then this is the flow which is taken out which we will come so I was just concentrating on the areas of R&D. So this is again, it is not that on the day one we knew that this is a cryogenic system, uh, cryogenic transfer lines we had to do. We had to go through an exercise of doing prototypes, building, bringing bits from companies, giving our engineering to them, and then handshaking in terms of what is to be delivered. It is an interesting story. Hold uh, your patience for some time to get into that. These are things which, you know, in, in simple terms, this is a kind of a system where you essentially have to produce some 60 amperes of particles equivalent. 60 amperes of accelerated particles. This is a different class of accelerator. These accelerators have plasmas in their initiation, electrostatic acceleration of the ions from the plasma. And these ions then will have to be neutralized and then pulled into the plasma as the neutral ones because of the fact that the no magnetic field around the tokamak will otherwise trap if they were ions. So this is done. But then in doing this, we don't have, today in the world, a source doesn't exist of this kind. So this is something which has to be developed and India is also a party to the developmental efforts to make this kind of a thing work. So these, are, these call for special developmental efforts in terms of understanding what is to be done. So this is like an ion accelerator which has its, which embeds in it different perspectives of matters. Now I will not go into too detail of this till I come back if I have this, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, time opportunity and your interest. The other point is the radio frequency sources. These are operational at around uh, 35 to 65 megahertz. And uh, these are in the power of 2.5 megawatts. The transmissions of the radio stations, they are uh, in, in some of the frequency ranges which, uh, which is lower than this, but in, in this kind. But that the big transmitters that they use, maybe 200 kilowatt, maybe a little more than that. These are very high. And these are high with a condition that Whatever you are generating out of these sources, they go to the plasma, they interact with the plasma. And when they get start interacting with the plasma, the plasma has an attribute of even reflecting back a part of the wave. When the plasma reflects back a part of the wave back into the system, the system electronics detect and the feedback system should be able to match it in a manner that it doesn't damage with a very high power coming back and reflected onto the tube and destroy the tube. 
So this, these become very complex and otherwise also this is for the first time in the world of course in collaboration with a company of, called Thales uh, as company Continental Electronics and the Indian uh, lab facilities that uh, we have demonstrated, we have worked and really produced this 2.5 megawatts of uh, uh, power, uh, power, 2 megawatts of power production from one of the sources and now they will be combined to really demonstrate the, 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 the capability to put in this 3 megawatts uh, in the full frequency range. What you see here is essentially kind of a, a network of how things are there. They, but uh, launching these RF also needs some antennas and other things. But just to have an idea of what the Indian groups are doing here is what we were trying to say. This is the other end of the spectrum that is in the high frequency 170 gigahertz range frequency. These are what Indranil was explaining to your question when he was talking of the resonances. This is the ion cyclotron resonance that is of the electron cyclotron resonance. So you, when it is dependent on the magnetic field that these resonance frequencies of these tubes are decided and when you decide then these are, this is called a um, uh, for the ion cyclotron this is a tetrode tubes and there it is called a gyrotron and gyrotrons are essentially things which produce this kind of high frequency microwave radiation grade and these gyrotrons are steady state gyrotrons of 1 megawatt at this point of time Toshiba in Japan has been able to perhaps meet this requirement and JICOM in Russia but JICOM's the Russian one is still the most uh, reliable one still there are issues with them but this is where we are and this is what we have to also we are working we will bring one of the gyrotron and learn the operation that is the primary mandate rather than you know into making of the gyrotron so there are also very important areas of very very high voltage power supplies these are power supplies which go to 100 kV ranges and they are in multi megawatt ranges and these are power supplies where the unique feature is, I said, some of the plasma is produced and then they are accelerated electrostatically. When you accelerate these plasmas, uh, ions electrostatically, ions extract the ions from the plasma and extract it, take them electrostatic acceleration. What you will invariably have is because of the, because of the uh, inherent uh, attributes of the um, system there is going to be a breakdown an arcing so about 7 megawatts of power has to be sh shut off in a microsecond time 10 microsecond time again lifted up within a few milliseconds to this capability so these are fast turn on turn off power supplies and they are very very special earlier before IPR uh, engineers invested efforts and brought these, uh, Thomson uh, in, in uh, Europe and uh, some of the Japanese farms were doing it. Today, there are the, with the full technology available from the IPR electrical engineers and the control and data acquisition engineers. This is a success story where incidentally Electronics Corporation of India Limited is the agency which is delivering to ITER and it has already been done and delivered to ITER today and it is operational with its uh, uh, neutral beam test facility which we were saying in Padova. Some of the diagnostics may not be of direct use unless you are a very hardcore physicist uh, in the first thing. But later, that 41 I was saying, what will you do when you operate the machine? How will you understand what is going into the plasma? How, what is the characteristic of the plasma? How can I improve the plasma? How can I feedback from a signal taken from this kind of diagnostics and operate the plasma more reliably? That's diagnostics. So understanding of the physics of the operation is at the core of the diagnostics. So there are these X-ray crystal spectra. All these are waves or all these are uh, entities which are essentially emitted by the tokamak and this is what you diagnose. So some of the diagnostics we do are in terms of the electron cyclotron emission, in terms of the charge exchange recombination spectroscopy, in terms of providing an X-ray crystal resonator and some, some uh, this thing what you call a, a, a kind of a hardware to bring the diagnostics in. Just for the moment we understand that yes to 
enable operational ease we are go getting into some going into some of the areas of the diagnostics providing the diagnostics so that 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 possibly could be so now comes uh, what i have already said here you will now just it's like a recapitulation of that the physics design engineering manufacturing testing experiments optimization and deliver so when we say that when we talk of engineering we look into the different aspects of uh, engineering i have already said that you look into the functional you look into the safety requirements you do what is called a typical load analysis and these are hardcore engineering terms don't get into the jargon of this but the engineering calculations this is a very engaging mode here what you do is essentially you really interact and play around with the configuration and design that you are working around to see what is the best fit that you can really bring out in the configuration some of the example if i get an opportunity i'll be able to show show that then you do the benchmarking of your calculations and this is done by an international or you do it normally by what you have from the database and then you subject it to a review and this review is by the international panel which is appointed by eater and then those uh, whatever if you are uh, through with whatever you have done it's done go for manufacturing or else reiterate on it so why has a system hum sorry similar is a route for the manufacturing that uh, you do the materials and you do you do this thing, uh, what you call define the process and define the quality requirements but let me see if i can get something more interesting for you here it is here it is forget that manufacturing that's more of uh, uh, more of details so what you primarily look for is any material that you take is the high strength has it revived bit so high strength corrosion resistance maintains uh, under unique operational conditions maybe 4k maybe 300k no, not 300 even 500k so and the compliance with respect to the nuclear safety requirements and all of these bring in what you have identification of material for this kind of things steel of a standard grade or some steel with boron content to reduce the neutron exit to absorb neutrons and interestingly something which is specialized and it is essentially to make this material is a metallurgist uh, nightmare to see this functionally working is his delight as well this is a material which is something which has to be very properly you know developed and it's very interesting copper as a normal we know it's a good conductor of electricity and thermal conductivity is good but then copper is basically soft you know no matter how heavy you feel about it but it is very soft it doesn't apply into structural grades of material as such the only way you can do it is then tinker around on the matrix of copper and what you start doing is you fill put in little bit of alloying elements in a manner that they go into the interstitials and into the grains and then they start hardening up the material and hardening it up in such a manner that you go to a higher temperature of operation also a normal copper would have been just flex this remains rigid tough and then what you do is you start finding out methodologies of even embedding in the jointing process now what is very important for us and i think i did not bring it in this uh, do not have it in this slide set is set is that all of these that you see uh, that uh, you know we we need to make these are copper components or steel copper components they have to have cooling water flowing through them because of the fact that there is an enormous amount of heat load as he was saying in every system there is a heat load and what are these heat loads like a board of this kind of size would take about 20 megawatts of heat 20 megawatts of power on just this any material will flash off 
in milliseconds if you have that kind of a thing material metal non metal nothing what you do you have to take that on the face of materials you have to have at the back end some cooling what do you do what kind of cooling do you use you can use a very high pressure gas or you can use water which is more simple you use water normally but when you use water how do i make a matrix that i have a water flowing inside and i cannot have the vacuum degraded what do i do i built in a component in a manner that this has inside it a good heat thermal engineering which essentially goes into the, from the roots of thermodynamics to that same fourier heat equation and such such things that you have they all play their role there after you have done the thermal engineering what do you do you essentially then do a manufacturing engineering in a kind that the jointing of the copper and the transition to any other material that has to be done has to be compliant without damaging the material in itself what is it that you use then do you use a normal arc brazing like what you see in our refrigerator coils they do at home they if they come to repair a ac or a refrigerator no it's not done because you you are essentially spreading the heat around that affected zone a lot so you use either lasers of a very sharp diameter or you use electron beams which essentially go and penetrate into the material and join in only that part that you need to be joined so this is the these are technologies of electron beam welding laser welding or some other material methodology of welding which is very very sophisticated less practiced in the industry less understood even in the research systems so do these trials make these components dissect them understand the metallurgy understand the behavior then give a prescription go back to eater say to them that this is what you have as a recipe because codes don't say about these we don't have codes available for these kind of things then you go into the practice of manufacturing this is the kind of work that we do this is the kind of methodology that we approach to really make things work and these when we say doing work we have to position ourselves uh, a, an european manufacturer or an american manufacturer or a japanese manufacturer and the indian manufacturer are all at the same level you have to work to bring that a part of the work we have done maybe next uh, generations that take over maybe having more uh, an improved solution like what you are showing the demo is a very big one the demo is also a very tricky one the neutron fluxes are in a very different domain and when you talk of neutron fluxes of very different domain the material perspectives change so what we are doing for eater is learning but that learning has to be translated better it is it is much more of an intensive work so i think uh, now you can you have what is new, new known the cryostat so these are you know specific details just don't get into it right now get into the fact that this is a very large assembly segmented and in a manner that it has been made it a very very high precision in the engineering workshops to come to a kind of a dimensional uh um, framework this is in the eater assembly so these kind of pieces have been sent to eater then they have been assembled inside this building which is the cryostat workshop at eater this is the only building other than europe that we have in eater and this had to be done for this facility then you make an edifice inside this building to build up the upper sections which i was saying the lower cryostat lower cylinder upper cylinder and such so here you can see that so you can see that these are the segmentations that have been done and these are the different pieces so today we are with this whatever you see in the violet color is all done and this is finally getting manufactured now and we will have the cover top lid done so this is what you have in the workshop now an interesting point here again for those who you know have the appreciation of what it needs to do things like eater this lower cylinder what you see here it was manufactured but it will be used not before 2023 maybe 2024 it cannot be kept as a steel component just in the ambient condition why because it is susceptible to corrosion so what do you do you then bring in a special way of covering it up how do you cover it not just wrapping it with a piece of plastic would do you have to cover it with a weather condition uh, in a weather condition mode so what you do is you cocoon it 
you then ensure that the hygroscopic aspect with, of the air inside is managed. So you pump it, you monitor the humidity inside and you keep it constantly under this for the next three years in a manner that this is perfectly protected. Just as an example, to do this kind of a cocooning itself is a cost of two to three million euros. So this is where, you know, projects of this kind, you know, get into the uh, way of, you know, delivering things. So, so this is just a view of that cryostat and incidentally this would be the largest vessel that of this kind of uh, configuration that has been ever made around in the globe uh, in the experimental systems today. So it is just an administrative aspect, I mean techno-administrative because this was handed over from India uh, very recently, the lower cylinder which I showed as a cocooning. Similarly, for these plates, which I said, number of plates, you now remember they are in between the plates, in between the vessel walls. So they have been manufactured and large part of what you see in green is done, delivered, completed. Then we have this, uh, incidentally, this vessel also is one of the, uh, our vacuum techniques company in Bangalore had done this, a marvel of engineering on the top flange. This is a nine meter long flange. Uh, it is a nine meter and this way it is a, uh, corresponding to a diameter of 5 meter, this is around 5.5 meter on the arc. And this is a flatness, if you, if you, if you take an understanding, this table top that we have is approximately about 2.5 meters. In this 2.5 meters, between this point to anywhere in middle and to the last, in this 2.5 meters, I will not allow a deviation beyond half a millimeter, half a millimeter. That is to be done in steel, machined, stressed, tortured, the material, you know, taking off a lot of material and maintaining that kind of a flatness. This is the work. And if you measure it today, you will see two centimeters of variation possibly across, maybe one and a half easily. But just to bring it to that kind of a precision, is what is the engineering. Engineering is not just the making of it, but making it to that kind of, is having a vacuum seal on the top. And vacuum seal, when it seals off with the top flange, they all have to mate in a manner that no ingress of air. And what we quantify it is, typically we say, as I was telling you, the number of particles in the vacuum, 10 to the power of minus nine millibar liter per second of gas at best can go through which is a very, very small quantity of gas going through. It is in the, in the molecular regime, of course, and very small. So these kind of things are done. So this is just a description again. This is what, when it is made and it is placed inside, this is there. If any of you have the opportunity to come over to IPR in India, you could get to see these kind of facilities which are in work. But this, of course, normally remains closed because of the because of the need for the operations and uh, installation works. Maybe here I can explain to you what I was telling you. See, this, this is something which, which is a grid. It's, it's an ion accelerator. It is a copper plate. It is about 8 millimeter thick. And what you are seeing is the front view. And this has a finer angling. But what is very important to notice what you see in this is you consider that these are water channels inside. So if you have to have water channels inside this, you have to have a full matrix of copper deposition up to two to three millimeters of thickness. If you do that kind of a thickness in this kind of a setup, what will you have? You will have something which is ultimately going to be embedded cooling channels inside. This kind of technology is called electro deposition technology. Globally, one company has the art of doing it today. And some of the Indian labs in RRCAT, we are trying to get this developed. And with it, Japan has now started doing this. Now, these are highly precise. Between this aperture to the next aperture, 50 microns is what you can have as the best, as the maximum possible deviation. So you talk in terms of you know uh, microns in, in, in precision. Up to the level of this beam, from here to uh, here to here, you cannot have a variation in the flatness that is essentially the planarity of it beyond something like uh, here it is about 80 microns, which are themselves a very, very big demand. So then I said about the engineering of materials, I said about the electron beam welding and all others. So these are areas where we really 
dwell into and get into. This has been done for the cryostat, for the grids and accelerators. Now I will leave you with uh, not going into the further details but just this bit and just take this part of the engineering. When we talk of cryogenics line, cryogenic lines, you talk in terms of inside one whole envelope you have process pipes one two three four five then there is a six small and seven these are the ones some may be taking in liquid helium into the system some may be the return all of these have to be embedded in a system in a manner that there is no heat flow from here to a minimum heat flow from the te lower temperature to the higher temperature basically there is I mean a thermalization between the lower and the higher so what do you do you do and then these are solid pipes and if they are with this kind of configuration then there will have to be some flexible arrangements but then you cannot put these flexible arrangements anywhere because you have to have an engineering approach to it so you model it you simulate it with the thermal in engineering base putting in the right boundary conditions then you make a small prototype you test the prototype you qualify the prototype and then you go to a bigger size which essentially replicates what is there in ITER. Qualify that, get it accepted by ITER or get, get it you know, reviewed by ITER and then go to the bulk production and this is what has been done in the system. And it is very interesting and also satisfying for us to say that having done this, there is an Indian company, Inox in Baroda, who has essentially set up a full cryogenic, cryotrans cryoscientific division to produce these kind of lines and today we can say on the company's behalf with pride that there is a manufacturer from India who can give you lines, cryo lines which is equivalent to air liquid or Nexon or any one of these companies who are big manufacturers and absolutely compatible with respect to all requirements of be it regulatory or other codes. Similarly, we have a cryo distribution, but then again, this is something which is more into the complex domain of how the fluid is distributed. But we had to take up a special development of a very high flow cold circulator to, to essentially cater to the ETA toroidal field magnets. But uh, this has been done, a development in Japan is uh, the one. But we again in intervened in a manner that we got two of them made, tested them in a Japanese lab by giving our engineering of what is to be done for the tests. But Japan provided the, we didn't have a refrigerator of this class. That is the reason we had to go to Japan and then qualified this. And these, qual uh, some of the manufacturing that you see is for the cryo lines qualifying them and putting them. These are the cooling water chillers, 450 kilowatts, half a megawatt of chiller each and they are large number of them are you know, installed inside. You have around 20 kilometer of piping network to the right specifications made and also these are handed over to the many of the Indians. Incidentally, if anyone we can take an opportunity to visit ITER. Today what you see mostly on the hardware is from India primarily and that is because many of the first plasma which he was mentioning is essentially Indian uh, contribution. These are the high voltage power supplies. You can see that there are multi-modular power supplies which I was telling you about. The, what I was trying to do is I tried to give you an overview of what is there and what is in the practice that has been done and delivered and what went on in before doing them. So these are some of the special transmission lines. You know. Any, any, any of you might be consider uh, understanding this that uh, these 132 kb transmission lines or even the sometimes around the 11 kb very rarely but more on the higher side you will hear this kind of discharges taking place if you go near a very high voltage transmission line you will get that that corona kind of discharges that take place now when you transmit it hundreds of kvs into the systems you cannot have this kind of discharges just going around you you have to have the shielding arrangements in a manner that really protects the whole ambience and environment so there is a special class of design special class of materials and really Really, something which uh, is is worthwhile probing into in terms of the insulator technology developments on the electrical engineering side, and this is what essentially IPR also is engaged in, and we have made a lot of contribution into these areas as well. So the uh, radio frequency, high frequency radio, uh, that uh, ICRH, is is something which 
I just said again it is a detail. What you see here again is a lab inside IPR that this is how the complex uh, set up and it is a state of the world. Any uh, state of the art, anywhere around in the globe you go, you find a lab, this would be one of those labs which you would see. It is just in fact one of the best possible facilities has been created here. And interestingly, um, when we talk of quality and this is again for uh, the senior faculties, we don't get always what we want. We do have a non-conformity, we do have a resolution of the non-conformities, we do have deviations which have come up and we map what are the changes that have come up, what are these, and these are all recorded. And interestingly you see, to air is human, you see that it contributes to the manufacturing, to the, to the realization. To, to sometimes the processes, sometimes you have errors in the you know process, doing of things, and all of these, if you take into and all of these, I mentioned to you welding qualification. I mentioned to you, I mentioned to you about quality, about the materials. You see this matrix that builds up, and also similarly for the deviations. So this is just as a, a snapshot of some of the projects that are there. But we do monitor and we try to really build up a database for ourselves, so that tomorrow when you guys come in, some of you guys come in and work in the system because ITER is going to go for long. So. So you will always remember that I have to minimize this, but at the same time, it is also said in terms of the quality domain, the more invasive your uh, production management is in, in terms of making technological products, the more should be the non-conformity and the deviation uh, records because it, that essentially establishes that the work has been done well. So this is, this is why we do this kind of uh, you know, assessment for ourselves. So again, the prototyping, as I said, many of the areas, these are, and each of these prototypes, uh, uh, friends, they are absolute fertile fields for a thesis work for any of you. I mean, it is, it is the, the learning of this, the, the science that has gone into each of these areas are in, in themselves standalone systems, each of the prototypes, all that I was saying. So. There is a plethora of, if not to work for fusion, if there is someone who wants to come and do research in, in this kind of things also, most welcome and you know, you should be able to do it. So, we, this is the cryogenic laboratory, which I was saying, it has essentially modeled a part of this eater kind of thing. This is the test rig for the, I think this is for the ICRH, which was like, this is something to, just to represent that this is, this was the artist, in, this was the artist impression and this comes into the reality. So I think uh, again uh, the, the, the technologies of different sources, some of the diagnostics but I think that is, that is what important to note is that this manufacturing for eater production research everything that is going on is always taking the bottom line that things which are done, they qualify according to the safety classification, they qualify according to the codes and standards, I am on the second bullet, they quali the quality requirements are always held supreme and each and every stage of what we do is therefore compliant with respect to the needs. Why quality, quality, quality in this is that anything that goes wrong and we have also encountered this not only with us but also with other domestic agencies that if there is a flaw in the system, you, you essentially, not only it is something which you need to retrieve and rectify, but you really need to make sure that this learning experience is propagated further down, not in the next instance. So, and the documentation is also what we engage in. Uh, 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 as an example, again, for uh, more, you know, personnel who are more experienced, we had some minor quality related issues in some of the deliveries related to simpler systems like cooling water. And why? Because in those kind of systems, we have what is called a 20% inspection uh, metric for the bulk that is every 100, you can take 20% of them. And there has been some errors in that. So we had to then immediately switch over to 100% quality inspection. Each radiography is to be inspected, each of the dimensions are to be measured and that essentially expanded the time but then we had to take this. This is a hit we have to take on the cost of the project production as well and enormous. I mean anything that we talk of our least count is essentially goes into crores of rupees. So we have global and Indian uh, collaborators, friends and 
seniors. There's an endeavor to do things in a manner that while we learn, we document, we try to pass on for the next generation to pick up, to do things in a manner that really complies with this. This is our mission and we are trying to just, you know, be with it to the best possible justice that we think we are doing. If we aren't, then let us have more feedback on how we could improve, of course, we need to. Thank you very much. Again, thanks for coming. If you have any queries and if you have still, I have really held you all for long, still if you what have any. What is the total cost of this IDA project? Okay, very interesting question and uh, obviously it is, a, it is a question which bothers everybody. It would not be right to say a very firm value, but uh, I think between 10 to 15 billion dollars, billion euro. Right, Indra? 20. 20. I kept that five for the next Vigyan Samagam <laughs> in the next years. Ah, yes, please. How much India? 10% of that. But then this 10% from India and this 10% if it is Japan or America, US or Europe is 45% is not the same. Cost of production in some of the things that you, uh, the vessels and all that big things that you see here, uh, whatever X cost that we are paying here, if it was made in Europe, it would be a factor of three at least because of the, uh, you know, you what is it called, worker intensive. When you do a polishing of the steel, there is, if there is no other than, you know, doing a machining, grinding with a, um, a manual intervention, that's a huge cost there. So Indian cost, you can roughly think of 10% of it. It would not be wrong to think of it because there is also a collateral R&D setup that we have. Uh, and in fact, it is one of the largest, it, as he said, it is the largest global project today. Scientific experiments, ITER is the largest. And in India also, this is the largest contribution to science. So that way it is. And, and therefore, if we do not bring in back home all the learning that we are doing, we would not be doing justice to the spending that we are having. So we are trying, that is why I said about the mission that we have. Okay. Uh, small, big, small, medium, large, if you take, maybe around 20 approx. If you take very large, Larsen Tubro, Kiloskar, uh, Godrej, not Godrej, not, not, not yet into the ETR, this thing, uh, Tata Consultancy in a large way, um, Kiloskar Brothers is into, into the pumps and other things. Um, these are uh, this thing, e Electronics Corporation of India Limited, ECIL in a large way, and um, Avasarala, I said, it, they are also doing a large contribution, uh, a Bangalore company. Uh, then there are these smaller companies like Vacuum Techniques or Hindai Vax or, or others. And several others, we were there from uh, Baroda and uh, Gujarat region. Uh, Inox is a large one, I forgot that. Inox is a very, very large contributor to the cryogenic systems. Each of these, if you take up a career in, in, the, in the industrial field, if some of you have in that, each of these companies actually have a new learning and it is indeed acknowledged. Because many of them have worked on the nuclear fields, but then this has exposed them to a new horizon. Because it has also given them an exposure to the international market. In many other companies' case, ETER directly contracts, gives them contracts, which is something which is, you wouldn't have an Indian company receiving an order for a system from an Indian manufacturer earlier. This is happening today. And they are straight away making and giving it to them. Okay. Thank you. Why are the magnets inside made in the shape of a torus and not a, not this is a regular circular cross section? First and foremost, uh, I will give my part of the answer and I am sure Indranil will have his part of the physics part. The plasmas that you have, these are called, these are diverted plasmas. These are diverted plasmas which are elongated in the shape inside. Now, if you take the vessel geometry, that should conform to normally with respect to the plasma because it's like a uniform whirl around the plasma. So that determines the vessel shape. Vessel shape then determines what should be the toroidal magnetic encasement because of the fact again that what field goes into the plasma is to be to the, to the best possible um, uniform. Uh, that is the first end, and if it really, if you want to add something to it.
once this becomes fully operational, so we will be able to control the fusion reaction taking place in the cell. Yes. Uh, primarily, what he said that uh, in the jet device, the, the, the plasma is, it's, it's, it's a different breed of species though. The energy that is there in the plasma, that is confined and contained. And that is essentially the ther thermonuclear power application. Now, it happens that the plasma can go out of control. When the plasma goes out of control, what happens is the plasma disrupts. It doesn't go into a nuclear bomb explosion reaction, but it disrupts. When it disrupts, it is an enormous amount of energy that goes into the devices and the whole machine edifice support, they take a large amount of load. For this kind of a plasma, which is, uh, which I think we, we couldn't touch upon that, there is a 15 mega ampere scenario, which is a very super aggressive current in the plasma. And when we do that kind of a scenario in the plasma, it is the regulator which is essentially looking into all the safety aspects of the device that you don't have a catastrophe. Uh, as such, the whole mission is essentially to control what is there in the bomb in the magnetic encasement. The magnetic confinement is therefore given to control. You, you will never have a situation where it will go out of control. Even if ha it happens, then it is only for a, this kind of a scenario, if you want to add. No. See, basically there are two aspects. Uh, <coughs> Tokamak has become so complicated that you, it uses today a very extremely sophisticated control system. So each electrical pulse, the fueling system, the vacuum system, everything is controlled in a controlled way. So there is very little manual intervention um, required. It, everything completely controlled you know, online. Uh, and uh, ITER is also, you know, uh, uh, if you want to control the fusion, uh, there is a scenario uh, also in ITER where it can go to a self-sustained reaction, an ignition condition. So basically what you do, if, uh, that is not one of the uh, you know, baseline of ITER, but ITER will try to achieve that, that you go to a very high uh, fusion gain and uh, then reduce the um, heating from outside and the fusion alpha itself which you generate they sustain the reaction by themselves and you just control the density to produce just the right amount of you know, reaction to self-sustain the reaction. That is like Q equal to infinity. Uh, it has that as one of the dreams of operation, but it is not a baseline. I mean, if you can achieve that, fine. If you don't achieve that, at least the baseline is Q equal to 10. But uh, everything is under control. There is no chance because uh, in any point of time, the amount of tritium in the system is very small. It is hardly a gram of tritium at any point of time in the machine. So there is no chance of an explosion. So uh, you basically you turn off the heating and the, the experiment stops. That's it. Any other questions? I see some of you have joined in just now. If there is an opportunity for you to come over tomorrow to then it will be very good. We just concluded on the two sessions. But, uh, we, we realize that this is a holiday school, many of the school. Yeah, tell your friends to come as many students. Yes, this is something, yes, I was capturing, yes. So, be ambassadors for this. If they want to, if they want to, you know, come and listen in, we would be more than happy to spend hours together to explain. But spread across the message, some of them at least can come tomorrow. I am sure we will be doing it in another perspective again tomorrow. I will not bring the same kind of approach to the slides when I talk tomorrow. Uh, it depends on the audience also, of course, but uh, do, do propagate, but the message will still be the same and the contents otherwise in terms of technical will be the same. Incidentally, ITER also gives you know, projects. You can do a project in ITER, uh, like uh, you are a final year uh, master's level student, you can do a project for four months. Uh, can apply. There is a way of applying directly to it. You can go there for four months. They pay for you. I pay you for that. Um, that's not a you, know, you can sustain yourself. Uh, so that is now uh, there is an opportunity, and that is open to all. Any student can apply if, if there is suitable for them. Is it a type of internship? It is an internship. Yes. yes. And and one important point I would like to mention. 
marks important. In the system that we see, the understanding part of science is what they appreciate the most. If they hold an interview with you, they will possibly see your credentials on the marks. But that's something, even if it is the best, it doesn't matter to them. As long as they don't see the fundamentals ingrained in the person. That's very important. So, whenever you do any learning, whenever you you are reading so many new things in your curriculum now. And it's another Kankata University, right? Kankata University physics curriculum is pretty good and I'm sure it has been enriched further. So, but, 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 you know, there is a lot that you can really learn. And, and, and that, that's again a part of the, when we integrate with them, we, we see that the overall how we should. Okay, I think I've spoken a lot. <laughs> Thank you.